Awesome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Life Talks. Today, I have a returning guest, Dina Mitchell. Dina. Dina. I, I'm going to always say Deanna because that's how it is, but it's Dina. I'm sure you get that a lot. Welcome that's again. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Good to be back. Yeah. So uh, for people who don't know who you are, if you could just give like a short introduction again of, you know, who you are, what you do, a little bit of your backstory. Absolutely. Um, my name is Dina Brown Mitchell, and I use Brown because there's some other famous people with Dina Mitchell. Um, so that's why I, I put Brown in there. That's my maiden name. And I am the founder and executive director of the Realize Foundation, which is all about suicide prevention with a different approach. And I'm also the president of a company called Genius and Sanity. And that is all about helping entrepreneurs get their sanity back. That's awesome. Um, maybe if you could share a little bit of your story, because you know we've spoken about it a little before on the last podcast. And I think it's very powerful because, you know, because I think it's, for me, there's two ways of sharing your story. It's one is that it's just about me, me, me. You know, it's look at me, poor me, my whole, and there's a lot of that, but I didn't, never got that sense when I spoke with you. For you, it's something pain that we have to look at within ourselves. For me, it was porn addiction for a long time that when we look in that and be with that and face that, we can help other people see it for what it is because we all deal with addictions and pain. And I think that when we share our own story, that can be a catalyst for other people's change in their life. Absolutely. And that, that has really become our mission is to use human connection to reduce suicide rates. And we do that through conversations, community, and personal story. And you've probably seen on our website that we released a book in February with 19 people's stories of overcoming adversity. We have two more books coming out this year, and it's going to be an ongoing project because it, telling your story is really healing. Um, and it's also a catalyst for people who are struggling to pick up a book and read in the privacy of their own home or wherever they are to see that someone else has been where they are and they're not alone and there is a way out and you can actually connect with the people in our book. You know, if you if you resonate with their story, you can connect with them personally. Um, and so it's it's gotten a huge um, response to the first book we put out in February. So we're really excited about the next ones coming out. And it all started with me sharing my story and trying to figure out how to help other people. And so I think that, you know, in 1997, I survived a suicide attempt. I was 27 at the time and I am 52 now, but it took me 23 years to feel like I could talk about it. Like no one in my life ever really knew the whole story or what happened or why. And I think that even myself, I didn't understand that most of my life I had struggled with depression and anxiety. And, um, you know, 2018 and 19, my anxiety was at an all time high because of some business things that were going on. Um, and I did figure out a way to turn that around in my business um, that I had prior to COVID. And it was like, you know, you think if you take time for yourself or you take a day off or you, you're you absent from your team or your clients that you're scared that it's going to hurt your business. Well, in my situation, my business doubled because I was taking better care of myself so when I was in my business, I was more productive. I was more on top of things. I was more creative and um, solution driven instead of like, what are all my tasks I have to do today? And I am so tired. So that was kind of the, the thing. But around that time, I lost a friend to suicide and it was somebody I had known for 20 years. And it really, I, I just felt like God was knocking me over the head. Like you have got to speak up. Because I felt like if I had ever been vocal, would my friend have reached out? Would he have talked to me? Could I have helped him? Would he still be here? And that was not a feeling I ever wanted to have again. Yeah. And so I started talking about it very reluctantly. I was petrified to share my story. I was scared it would hurt my business. I was scared that I would lose clients. I was, I was scared that people wouldn't trust me. All of those things. And I think that it was... Um, it was the opposite. When I started being vulnerable 
and talking about it, the support was overwhelming. And so that's how the foundation was started. And, you know, it, it, it has been an amazing journey the last two years just to be able to do things that can help other people and give them hope. And we have a lot of things in the works right now. So by the end of this year, we're going to be in a whole new place with two more books and a new website and all kinds of things happening. So it's really, it's really exciting. Yeah, I think I think there's so much power in that I relate to in the sense that well, there's two things I picked up. One is I talk a lot in my videos about you know spirituality and what that means. And I think that for a long time, spirituality has been posting cute Facebook things, you know, and saying, oh, life is beautiful and these nice things that they're almost like band-aids on, on the pen. And we may see, and there may be truth in it, right? And I'm not saying don't share nice things. We need more nice things on social than, I mean, the crap, the ego stuff. But going to that dark place in ourselves. I think if people are truly honest, that thought will cross people's minds more than people will want to admit. It's like, why am I here? At least why am I here, right? And I think that if that answer, if that, if there's not a better answer to that than, you know, going around the circus of life, right? The thrills and the chills. If there's no meaning there, then that deteriorates. And I think it should deteriorate. It should get louder. You know, it should get to that point where you hit that breaking point. Was it 2018, 19, you said? Yeah. Where it gets to that point where it's like your body's screaming at you because you're not being the full authentic self. And we, we only, I think, grow when we're around someone else who can challenge us and love us in the way where it's like, I, the best I can relate to it, I always bring it up. It's like Goodwill Hunting, Robin Williams and Goodwill Hunting, where he just like was able to slice through, like, you know, and, and get him to open up. And it wasn't a fake. It wasn't like, I don't want to say, I don't want to be a hater for Dr. Phil, but like this generic, like kind of, you know, say fake therapist, someone who just has the credentials, but you just know real when you're around it. And I think the realest way that the realest people there are out there are the people who've been through it. So you end up becoming that person by going through the experience, right? Of saying, God, I wanted to kill myself. And this is my story. This is what led me up to that. And this is what, and I see now, it's like, you know, what I think just by, and I don't know, maybe, you know, we can dive into this, but is to, to have purpose that's worth living, which is, you know, you're doing genius insanity. You're doing things to say, you know what, this vision I have is going to help so many people. And that makes life worth living. And that will come back to you too, as you're giving to other people. So maybe we can shift gears there and we can get into genius and sanity and you know, I want to hear about that. Yeah, well, I think that for the one thing I want to say is this saying that I heard in the past two years that to some people, they've heard it over and over and over and other people have never heard it. So I'm just going to say it, but it's like when you're trying to figure out what your purpose is and you, you're struggling with it because I've been struggling with it for, for a while. I'm, I'm getting more clear now, but someone said to me, you can't see the label from inside the bottle. And I had never heard that before. And I was like, so like the people around me can see the label and they can, you know, they can hear me talk about what I'm doing and they can, they can see things that I should do or I should say, or I, whatever, how I can help people better than I can. And so that really, helped me understand like I needed to get reflection from other people in order to really understand what my purpose was and what I could offer to the world and so in 2020 when everything shut down and and I lost my business I didn't know what to do with myself and I was starting the foundation but I I had to figure out how I was going to make money like what am I going to do with myself and so I went to this virtual event that was called the virtual event on virtual events. And it was something that I thought, well, it's event people. I can go to this, see what a virtual event even is. Cause I never experienced that and say, you know, maybe it's something that could help me save my business. And so I went to this three day event for $97 and it changed everything. It was like, I never 
I had never experienced anything like that. It was the first time I had ever been in Zoom. <laughs> like I had never even been on a video with somebody before. And it was all about the coaching world. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't something that I ever knew about, ever understood. Like the extent of my knowledge was that I had heard Tony Robbins name and I thought sure. he was like a business consultant or something. I didn't even really know what he did. And so the people that were putting this on actually do all of his events and a lot of other people that are, are very well known in that world that, that I didn't know back then. And so it, it got me thinking like, you know, the kinds of events that my company did did not really correlate to virtual events because of the type of, you know, we did high end corporate incentive travel. So it was doing ground logistics all over the state for different corporations who wanted to um, give back to their employees in form of travel and experiences. And so that didn't really work on virtual. But what I did learn is that what I was doing with the foundation was very valuable to all the people that were in these virtual rooms with me. They were all supportive, like right away, like they could see it and I couldn't. And so that's why I brought up that quote, but it, it's that started it. And then I started doing some virtual events for the foundation. And that's how Scars to Stars was born. And it, it just, it just kind of blew up from there. And so Genius Insanity is my way of, um, it's a coaching and consulting business. And we do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And we also are looking to start a mastermind probably in the next few months. And that, that is just so business owner, I, I'm targeting like smaller business owners, entrepreneurs who have like two to five employees. They're, they've been successful, but they're stuck and they're not sure how to move forward. They're not taking care of themselves. They're exhausted. They're not, they're not spending time with their family. They're working all the time. Like those are the people I can help because I was that, I was that person. And I did figure it out before COVID. And then everything crashed, but it's, it's having a support system to help you grow your business and be that business consultant, but it's also there to keep you accountable for taking care of yourself and setting boundaries and routines and things that, and systems in your business and delegation where you can own a business and be successful and not feel like you have to spend every waking moment on that business. Yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, being able to yeah, feel like when, you're, when you're trapped, you do have to take care of yourself, right? There's this thing where it's like, it's not necessarily about just working harder, right? It's like, it's it's so important that you you have that, like that self-love, that you find that balance um, because especially in like, you know, like in this, you got to work harder, work harder. And I think, I think it also depends on the person too. I think that if someone is like, you know, really lazy, then they need to be working harder. And it's like, you know, when you're in that, when you're really in that self-love, you know how to be, you know, especially working with employees too, like what, what each individual needs to hear, right? Like there's not a one size fits all for everyone. And, uh, you know, I was also thinking of what you said before, and I, I made a quick note, you know, this idea of like, am I responsible for the person, your friend, committing suicide right and it makes me think because you know the the instant answer is <clears throat> generally it's like it's not your fault but i i to me a spiritual way of saying it is that everything is our fault and it's not our fault at the same time in other words we are so we if when we take more responsibility in our lives every it makes you more it's not your fault right we said we start from that right because you can get guilt and but it becomes a catalyst to, you know what, you're going to be able to help other people. And every single person we interact with, we can change their lives with just saying something so small. Hey, you know what? Good job. And mean it, right? Not like just saying like these menial things. We're just like, we're just saying it to saying it, but actually genuinely actively listening to the people we're with. Because sometimes it's like being in corporate America, right? I'm sure it's just like you're in these meetings and there's like this monotone and it's like, it's those people who can like slice through that bullshit where it's just like, and they give life, right? And it's like active listening and it's just being there. And it's like, you know, if someone's sad, being sad with them, not just saying, oh, be happy. Like, 
that's not what people want to hear when they're sad, like really being actively listening. Because I think, I think it's easy to say when we take away responsibility and say it's not our fault. I, I think there's a way of self-love to say we are responsible to really helping other people. If someone's depressed, then really, you know, um, does that make sense? Like, because not, if, you know, not, yeah. obviously not beating ourselves up because people can, it's, it's but. Well, I, I'm sorry, I was writing a note because I there's two things I wanna I want to share. And one is I'm recording this, this, these videos right now that we're putting on our website for free that are, it's gonna be called the Hope Course. And it's really all about finding, you know, people who are struggling, they come to our website. We get a lot of people coming to our website in the middle of the night. And I know they're struggling. And I was trying to think of what can we do for people who come there when the rest of the world is sleeping and what could help them in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so the hope course will be, how do we talk about it? Which is not only like, how do you talk about it if you're struggling or how do you ask for help? But it's also, how do you support somebody? So like what you were just saying, they don't want to hear that what 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 I call toxic positivity. They don't want you to say you have so much to be thankful for. You just need to be happy. You know what you need to do in that moment. If you have a loved one that is struggling with suicidal ideation, you need to know. They need to know that you're there to support them. Yeah. They don't need you to tell them anything. They need you to listen. They need you to listen, and they need you to just be there. Like even if it's like okay, we're going to go on a hike and not say a word. We're going to go watch a movie and just sit there and watch a movie. Like it do, there doesn't have to be conversation. There doesn't have to be a solution. They just need to know they're not alone. Yeah. And so that's just the first part of our hope course that we're doing. I, I want to I dive into this. It's, it's just popped in my head because, and I'll share my experience, right? Because to, to not judge others, right? Judge myself first, my own character. <laughs> when I was stuck in porn, you know, when I would get feedback from other people, it would always be like, it's not a big deal, as long as it doesn't bleed into other aspects of your life. And that was decent advice, right? Like as long as, you know, everybody has their vices, whatever. But looking back, you know, when as I'm developing and I want to help like-minded men who are going through the same thing, I kind of wish I had someone light a fire under my ass, right? And I, I want people to tell me the truth. But at the same time, if I was in the deep, in the depths of my addiction, if somebody said it, I might not have heard it. So there's a part of me that's like that. It's it's it's, and and we talked about this before the call briefly. Like like, you know, the differences between men and women, right? Like this idea that the to me, women in their nature are nurturing. You know, I would go to my mother for issues if like you know was, uh, I needed like a little mom, my mother's love. But if I needed kind of cutthroat advice I would go to my father. Well, what are you going to do about it kind of thing? And I needed both of those things. So I think I think it's it's so important to have that motherly aspect and the fatherly aspect. I think it's good to have both motherly and fatherly aspect, you know, maybe coaches, right? Hearing different advice, you know, um, from different people. I guess my question is how 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 can we tell the truth with love? Right? Because if 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 I have an addiction, there's a piece of what I, what you just said, I agree with, like, you know, you need to be there. You just need to listen to somebody's pain, right? But I think at a certain point, there has to be a challenge or a confrontation, right? We're both Christians, right? We both follow Christ. Christ confronted, and I think our society forgets that. He confronted hypocrites and he taught us, at least I interpret it, we start with ourselves and we go within our own heart. And we attack the hypocrite within ourselves. We, we start to grow in integrity there. And then we can call out, we have to point out the moat in our own eye before we point out the moat in other, in other people's eyes. So I guess, how do we tell the truth with love? At what point do we confront? Well, I think that, I think that there's, um, you know, what I was saying was from a place of suicidal ideation. Sure. Because when, you know, there's so many people that have loved ones that are struggling with that and they have no idea how it feels or no idea what to say and what not to say. And so they're scared to say anything and they just shut down and then the person feels even more alone because they don't talk to them. So I think 
what I said was really somebody who is very fragile in a, in a suicidal ideations point in their life where you, they just need support. They yeah. just need to know people care and they're not alone. Now there are stages of, from that point to getting like to where I am, where I don't have those suicidal thoughts anymore. And I am mentally healthy compared to where I used to be, but it took time. And I think that, that in those situations and even in addiction, you have to take baby steps to get there. And I think it's easier when you're having an addiction conversation to be very stern and be very like, you know, the tough love kind of approach because I've had some, I've had people in my life who have been addicted that if you, if you aren't stern and don't practice tough love, you're just enabling them. Yes. So I think the way you treat someone who is suicidal and someone who is addicted is very different. Mm -hmm. Although it can, there can be people who have both at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I do think that, but I also think um, like in our next book, I wrote a chapter called Invisible Scars. And what I talk about in that chapter is that we never know what the person next to us is dealing with or the person on Zoom with you or, the, or your spouse. Like you never really know everything that is going on with them and, and what they're dealing with. And if we can provide support in a way that they will open up and talk to us about it, it's, it's, it's gonna help us understand, it's gonna help them heal or get through whatever it is. But you know, there were lots of things in my life for decades that I never talked to anybody about. And that was part of my problem, you know? And, why, and do you I, why do you think that is, right? Because I guess maybe there's guilt and shame and hiding, right? Because I can relate to that. Or what, what, would, what is it that makes us hide? Is it judgment from other, like, what is it, you know, from your perspective? I think, I think it's judgment, it's shame, it's yeah. not feeling good enough. It's, you know, for most of my life, I always felt like I had to prove myself to everybody. Like, I don't know, I don't know where this came from. But I was always that person who wanted to do everything and had to be good at everything. And so it was like if I played sports and I wasn't, you know, which I, I, I played sports and some of them I was good at, some of them I was not. Yeah. But when I was not, it was detrimental to me. It was, it was very hard for me to take that I wasn't good. And instead of quitting and saying, I'm not good at that, I should do something else. I just kept trying and trying and trying. And I think that's kind of what I, what, what we do in business too, is like, we try when we're a business owner, we try to do everything and try to be good at everything. When we have a team that has better strengths and areas than us, and we need to just let that person do that thing because they're better at it than we are. And once we release that, control and have some help like expert help you you are going to be so surprised at what happens in your business it's going to skyrocket because when we're trying to control something that we're not good at we're we're holding ourselves back yeah a good leader knows how to delegate authority and i i i did things like that for a long time and i thought i was a good leader and i was in a lot of ways but in that way i wasn't and until we can get to that place where we trust our team and we know their strengths and how to play to their strengths and how to play to our own strengths. And, you know, somebody said to me one time, they're like, I need to start hiring people and I don't know how to write a job description for these people I need to hire because you're a small business and everybody kind of does everything, right? And what she said to me was, you write a job description for yourself with everything you like to do and you're good at and you delegate everything else. And I was like, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's very true. Yeah. I don't know if yeah. I answered your question. <laughs> no, no, you did. Um, so going, going to what you said, you said you wanted to have a mastermind, but what for people who don't understand what that is, what is that? Sure. It's, it's really just a, a group that enables you to have peer support as an entrepreneur because normally 
as entrepreneurs, we are the leader and the person making the decisions and the pe person with all the weight on our shoulders, but we don't have a peer to talk to. And I think, you know, in my former business in the event company, I, I worked, I hired a lot of vendors. And so there were a lot of vendors that we worked with that had owners of those companies that I would talk to, or they would call me for advice, or I would call them to talk to them about a problem. And so it's, it's kind of like that. It's like a, a mastermind is a group of peers that are on a, a high level of achieving and of, you know, being leaders and they don't have um, that support. And like, my husband is the most supportive person you will ever meet. He, he loves me, he would do anything for me, but he doesn't understand my brain as an entrepreneur. And so it's really hard to, um, ha you know, talk to him because I'm expecting him to be my business coach. And that's not what he is and not what he does. Sure. And so this group um, would be something where we would have our own support system. We can help each other with business ideas. We can help each other with, um, you know, like putting someone on a hot seat and say, okay, what's your biggest problem right now? How can we help you fix it? Gotcha. Um, but it's also where we can get together and have like, retreats or, um, you know, just monthly calls where we can get together and ask, ask questions of each other, learn from each other, support each other. And I think there's a lot of these kind of groups out there and they're all business focused. And I would like our mastermind to be business focused, but also personal focus on the, the entrepreneur themselves. And are they taking care of themselves? Are they, because it, the, the shower genius method that I have come up with is really teaching you if, to go from stuck to growth. And the key is self-care and creativity. Yeah, dive into that because I saw that it was, uh, <laughs> that was on your block, correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and that um, was three days ago. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I probably, I, I don't think I did a very good job of explaining it in that blog so I'm about to make a video to make give some clarity um on our YouTube channel but I think that you know the shower genius method came about because my business was called genius insanity and I was in a place during the pandemic where I didn't have any work and I was going crazy because I needed to create and and build something it's just how how I am and what my DNA. And so I would take showers and I have really long hair. And so I would be in the shower and I'd have soap in my hair and I'd have all these amazing ideas. And by the time I got to my desk, I couldn't remember them. Interesting. And so what I did was I put a whiteboard in my bathroom. And hence the shower genius, because there is science behind the water and the you know, like the me time that gives you that your, your brain room to be more creative. And when we're at our desk, 12, 15 hours a day, we're not in that state. That's so the so more, interesting. The more like for me, I get into that place when I'm running or I'm like pushing myself, exerting shower. It's like, no, so that's why it's really interesting. So yeah, whiteboard well, it's funny because I, I was reading something yesterday that said exercise, shower, or one other thing where they were saying that those are the times people are the most creative. Yeah. So exercise is not that for me, but it is for you. Yeah. So I think it was, it, it's, there's science behind when you practice self-care, you free your brain up to come up with the solutions you need and the ideas you need to implement in your business so that you can reach the goal or whatever you're trying to reach. And I experienced that in 2018 and 19. I started taking better care of myself after a surgery that put me in bed for two months. And before that, I was telling my doctor, I was like, I can't be out for two weeks. I can't, you know, because he said two to six weeks. And I was like, two weeks. I'm giving you two weeks to get me better. Yeah. <laughs> and I literally was in bed for two months. So it, it was like God teaching me a lesson yeah. that my team was awesome. They stepped up, they took care of everything. My clients were happy. And I took that opportunity to start taking care, better care of myself. 
and setting boundaries for myself about work. And when I did, my business doubled. And so this method of the shower genius is really the, the methodology of how do we go from stuck to realizing that self-care is crucial to our business, not just our own health, but to our business. Yeah, that meant that. That reminds me, I don't know if you ever heard of uh, Letting Go with David Hawkins. He no. Book book. Yeah, check that out. But he has a scale of consciousness and there's this idea. <clears throat> it's power versus force and in force, it's control and power is where you are. <clears throat> it's, when you're operating your power, you're operating in flow state, when you're operating on the force, is like forcing things to happen. And it, it, you have to get to the place where it's a process of letting go, letting go of being in control, which ironically, you actually get more control by not being in control. And this is where you get into this paradox. It doesn't make sense, right? That's why I was, I was trying to articulate this before. I didn't really do a good job. But like when you are working harder and you're working harder and working harder, you just work can actually work half as much and you're working efficiently it's like the working smarter right and and not everybody sometimes you know like i said before it's not a one size fits all some people work better working more out so but this idea of that self-care is just letting go it's not this force it to go harder it's like let me reevaluate let me let go let me take care of myself let me wow then ideas flow and then you're able to be more you know you're operating on power versus force right it's like you can even the, the things that we love the most sleep try to force yourself to go to sleep or let go and go to sleep. it's when you let go it's like nature knows right it's like a bowel movement anything you know so so yeah completely what, was, that. Just made me think of that. what was david's last name david hawkins yeah i talk about him on a lot of the podcasts i do and he, okay. he's got a chart here i'll show you real quick here that's cool actually you know what let me see if i can find one because I you'll appreciate it. Um, but it but, while you're looking at it, it, it is true because you, when you're in that mode of stress and, um, you know, working so many hours straight, your brain loses its power. And yeah. it, it's proven that it, even if you drink water or take a walk outside, it, it relieves that stress in your brain so it can think better. And water, I mean, your body is made up of water pretty much 80, 90%, something like that. Yeah. And the more water you drink even helps your, your brain power. Yeah. Yeah, little things that yeah, bleed into everything else. Um, but I mean, this is one of them, find another one, but on the bottom is shame guilt, uh -huh. apathy, grief, fear, desire. And all these are indicators. I mean, we talk about suicide, right? These are, this is, it's a blessing when you're, when you get to that place where your body's trying to work with it, right? If you're depressed or whatever, it's like, these aren't, this isn't something to be ashamed of. It's the same thing of like looking at like a, um, you know, if you're, if your car says empty on gas, right? You don't, the goal is to say, hey, we got to fill up the tank. How do we fill up the tank? We don't want to destroy the car. We don't have to throw the car out. It has its function, right? So, and, and it's sad when people, it's it's really sad because it just, it's your body helping you out. Just saying, hey, you're not where you're supposed to be. Just try to look at this differently. And, you know, and when we start to listen to our body, then it, it's breaking past this. Right here is courage, right? So you have the courage to tell your story. I have the courage to tell my story. And from there, we grow into, you know, and ultimately we get to the high, this is a synchronicity, right? When life just flows and we have feelings of joy and um, the world is all about happiness, just desire. You get this thing and then, you know, you get the money and then you're going to get more money and then you're going to get more money. And it's like, we shouldn't reject money, but it's like, when you're in joy, it's like the money's flowing to you instead of you chasing it. But this is, it's really a, the official chart. It's like... Uh, yeah, it's like this one. This was I've seen some of those charts before, but I didn't know his name. So I'm going to look up that book. But yeah, it's really, it's really cool because too, you get to see, you know, people say they believe in God. And what's cool about the chart is that it shows people are like a reflection of God. 
you know, so if someone says, I don't believe in God, they're really saying they don't believe in that part of them themselves. So if they say, oh, I don't believe in this judging God, they're actually a judgmental person. It's really crazy that, I mean, my definition of God right now is like, I can't, it's, it's just isness. And I hope to be connected. And I think isness is flow. It's like, you just, it's this deep intuition that you know so little, like, like, it's it's why I'm, I'm very I'm not a judgmental person, but I'm also very judgmental if I see something that happens in front of me that I know in my heart because I can judge that. I can't judge everybody. Still, I don't know enough of all the things going on. It, if we, it's actually to say, like, it's it's this idea that I it's my it's a blessing to not know so much. It's like, you know, this idea where I won't go too far into it, but trust the experts, right? The fact to, to say that one person has the has it all figured out is like, it's so insane to me. It's like, you know, to, to, and, and you know, we can, this is actually a good thing to branch off because you were just talking about delegating authority. Now, some of the people I look up to the most are like, what do you think about? It? People who are brilliant will ask you, what do you think about it? They let other people talk and really they're, they're, you're working in synchronicity with other people versus I'm the boss. I know you don't know. And it's like, it's so counterintuitive that you give that power away, you become more powerful. And I say powerful, it's just organic power versus political power. No, I agree with that. It's true. And, and I think that for some of us that do ascend to being the boss or being a leader in some case or politician or whatever it is we obviously had to have the drive and the knowledge to get there right and there's not that many people who you know make a million dollars in business or ha start a business that lasts 10 years or you know there's not a lot of people who can achieve things like that so i think when people do it they think they have you know it figured out but I think the smartest leaders are the ones who ask others about their opinion, because like you said, no one person knows everything. And sometimes there are people, we surround ourselves with people who are smart too, and they sometimes know better than we do in certain situations. Yeah. And, and I think the key is people being tapped into in their inner, like, I think the people who are not productive are the people who are not tapped into their own inner strength. Because yeah. then they're just trying to, not all, it's so hard to say like something in stone, but the idea that it's, in other words, we talked a little bit about group identity before, like the idea that what I don't, what I, I am not a fan of group identity where people will cling to something to fit in just for the sake of fitting in, right? right? Um, but when you, I'm all for a group of people who, truly are themselves it's like in the truest sense that they have the they have the strength to call me out of my bullshit they also have the strength to be compassionate to me that they it's it's back to that charge when you're when you're in your flow state and you're around other people in flow state that's my group my group of people who really and to me that's maybe another way of saying connecting with god right like people who are focused on where is my inner strength and how can i share that with other people and then and then, you know, that's really the source. People, it's like, it's like, it's like a good parent to me doesn't tell their kid what to do. They inspire them to be the best version of themselves because that's, that's, that comes back rather than, you know, a lot of the problems that we have shame and guilt, which bleed into all different institutions, right? I'll, you do what I say because I'm your father. Then they grow up growing up to say, I'm going to do what you say because you're my boss or whatever. And then they don't have that creative potential, which is so powerful. It makes so much money around them. And, you know, some of the greatest entrepreneurs are people who see that potential in, in people. It's, it's like investing. You're investing in people. Yeah. But I guess maybe shifting gears we close in on this is, you know, your, what is your view on faith and how does it play a role in it? And, you know, one of the, the things that I really want to tap into, so I think there's a big niche for it, is that how do we get people back to Christ in a way that's not like, 
follow Christ, you know, like it's not like it's not like dogmatic. Well, I think that pushing it on anyone is the worst thing we can do because, you know, I think that the people who have a negative um, opinion of Christians is because they've been pushed in a way that was not um, a Christ-like thing. I, I don't know how to explain yeah, it. I I, but I, yeah. think that I, I think the best way that we can bring people to Christ is to spread our own light and to model model Jesus's um, everything about him like you know by talking about how faith has changed my life I think it plants seeds with other people um, and, and it's not me telling them you need to come to church you need to do this or that it's just me modeling what has happened in my life because of my faith and that was part of the blog I wrote this morning that has disappeared completely. I don't know what happened to it, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to try to find it and post it today. But it, it's like, you know, like I was telling you earlier, I was sitting on my porch reading my devotional today and I had notes on that page from two years ago, which was the week I decided to close my business. And I was a disaster that day. And I took a picture of myself like after I had been crying for hours. And like I said, it was, it was for me to reflect on that picture of like that time and what happened. And, and I'm not a selfie kind of person, but I felt like I should post it in the blog because I felt like it's going to help someone else. Um, and I think the whole last couple of years of me being so vulnerable and talking about my journey in so many ways and personal things, um, is because of my faith. It's because I feel like it's my purpose and I'm being led to do the things I'm doing. And, you know, there's some people out there that have known me my whole life that probably think like, why is Tina sharing all this personal stuff? Well, if I can save one life, that's all that I care. I just, you know, when you lose a friend to suicide and you feel like you could have done something, it is, it is just what drives you because you don't want to feel that way again and you don't want to lose somebody like that and so I think that between that happening I think it was my wake-up call and I think it was God saying okay now you're just you know I'm glad you built this business and you did a lot of good but now it's gone and now you have nothing else to focus on and this is what I want you to do and I really feel in my heart that all of that happened for a reason and I don't know the first time I talked to you if I, if, if it was before or after this, but I turned 50 in January of 2020. And on that day, I got a tattoo on my arm that says thankful for the scars. And it is all about this journey and about, it's a Christian song too, that actually like probably helped me through every day for a while, but it, it really is a gratefulness in my heart for all of the things that have happened in my life that that were not good but I've healed from them and I want to use them to help others and if I didn't have my faith I would have never had the strength or a courage to talk about any of it yeah yeah faith is really the ability to it really is something that I think we can love a lot because the ability to have faith is to me, it's it's insurmountable. As, it's the strongest asset we can have in our culture right now. And what I mean by that is that faith is having the because I've thought about this recently. Faith is having the ability to see what's going on and continue to move on. Right? We we met through Charlie Warren. A lot of people who see through a lot of the lies of our culture, a lot of the hypocrisy, the, the politics, the inflation. All of these things, the people who are not just going along with the bandwagon and they see how crazy shit is, but they just say in their heart, I see it all and I, I'm still going to keep moving forward. I'm going to do what I can. I'm, as you said, I'm going to shine that light. 
that light of just like, just keep going, just do what you can. As many, because many people just block it out and they just don't look at it, which a piece of that I think is good, right? You don't want to stare into the abyss when you come to the abyss, but to, to see it and move through it, right? Rather than just ignore it, everything's fine, sticking your head in the sand and then saying, I hope it works out. Well, those, to me, that's when, when things start to get harder, which they are getting harder, they're, they'll crumble. And then they, the end, which is a good thing too, right? As you said, you know, friends or whoever are going to say, well, why are you doing that? Why are you sharing your story? If in your heart you're doing it or whatever you're doing for the right reason, or you're not doing it for self-serving purposes, right? Which I don't get that feeling from you, right? And, and the people who are going to push back, you're trying to help other people. Right? I think it, the problem becomes, at least for the way I see it, when it becomes like a crusade and you're almost pushing your thing like on other people, it's like, you know, I don't, I don't see that, you know, not even like, I'm not a selfie person really either, right? Like, you know, um, but, but that to me is, is what the, the faith, that's really what faith is, is, is to be able to look at that and converting those negatives into positives. Oh, gas is going up. How can I see that as a positive? That's hard to do, right? Because it's a fat high. Oh, food prices are going up. How can I use that as a positive? It's not easy. That's only founded for you. It's like the shower with the whiteboard. How can I take this pain of like, you know, what we're going through and convert that and, and say, you know, and how can I be there for other people? How can I shift that uh, into, you know, believing? Because people gone through such or just study history people have gone through such worse things than, than what we're going through right and not to take it that away but you know it's it's kind of you know the, the saying where it's like when you when you have gratitude you can't like it, it feeds off of itself you know so gratitude is something that um gratitude and journaling um definitely were probably the the things that helped me most through the worst times. Yeah. Yeah, journaling is something I just started really doing more of. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I guess I got one more question too. Is, is, okay. You know, and this is also for me too, when people listening. Um, like, what got you into writing? Because um, for me, that's kind of a problem, is, is translating. Because I'm a thinker. I'm a thinker. I've made a lot of videos. I can get my thoughts out there. How did you translate those thoughts into, you know, writing? What was, were you, did, is that how you started out? Were you always a good writer? Or how did you translate those, th those thoughts onto paper, you know? Well, I think that, you know, the very first thing I ever wrote that was published was in 2018. And it was because someone reached out to me on LinkedIn and asked me if I would write a chapter in an anthology book. And I was like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah. And so I, it, it was called Journeys to Success. If you search me on Amazon, you can find it. But it, I wrote a chapter, basically, it was about my business and how I had proceeded from having a business at age 14 until the business I had at the time you know, a few years ago and what that journey was like and why, how I was successful and what, what all I went through to get there. And so I wrote that chapter with no, there's no editing help in that chapter. I just wrote, it, it was the first thing I ever wrote, except for, you know, my mom read it and helped me a little, but it, it was, a it was something that I'll give you a little backstory. So in 1990 and 92, I worked in Alaska at the Denali uh, Princess Lodge while I was in college. And in 1990, Mount Spur erupted the day I was trying to leave and go back home. And they closed down the Alaska, the Anchorage airport for like two or three whole days, which had never happened. And I was supposed to be going to San Diego to visit a friend. And then I was going back to LSU. I was in architecture school at the time. And when we were, there were five of us in a Jeep and we were driving from Denali to Anchorage and about halfway we stopped at the store, convenience store or whatever. 
And I was really excited about going to see my friend in San Diego. And so I was ready to leave. And I came out of the bathroom and they're like, Dina, they all looked at me like something was really wrong. I was like, what is going on? And they're like, well, Mount Spur erupted and they closed the airport. And I was like, what? So we kept driving and all of a sudden it got like black, you know, it's the middle of the day. Yeah. And it was all this smoke and everything. And so we got to Anchorage and there was like inches of ash everywhere. It was, it was crazy. Um, and so what happened was I got to California. I had lost all my luggage. I never got it back. I didn't have any clothes, nothing. So I spent a few days there. And then the day that I'm going to the airport in San Diego to go back to Louisiana, I, they're like, Dina, you need to come see the news. And it was Hurricane Andrew hitting Baton Rouge. And so I got home, but there were like the whole LSU campus was flooded. There was no electricity. There was trees down everywhere. Um, it was a really bad hurricane. And so when I got home and I was telling my friends in school about this whole trip and what had happened, somebody said to me, you need to write a book. And I was like, what would I even write about? Like, I don't, I'm not going to write a book. Right. And so that was my 20 year self. And all those years since then, it's always been in the back of my head. Like, why would I write a book? Like, what would I write about? You know? And so when this person reached out to me on LinkedIn and said, would you write a chapter? I was like, well, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote that chapter. And then after that, the, the next year, the same publisher called me and he's like, I've been wanting to write this, this other book about God and business. And would you be willing, you, you know, you mentioned faith in your first chapter. Would you be willing to write another one? So I wrote another one. And then I was like, you know, probably one day I'll write my own book. I don't know. And then with, with the Scars to Stars, with our foundation and nonprofit, we started writing books. And I just wrote the foreword in the first one. Um, and this one I'm writing, this next one, I do have a chapter in. And so, and I am working on a book about the shower genius because I think it's really important um, you know, if people aren't in my events or in my courses or one-on-one -on -one coaching, they can still get the concept of how self-care can change their business. And so that's kind of how it is. And I, I would not say that I was ever a good writer. I think writing and journaling has helped me feel like I write better. Um, but I also have somebody editing my stuff now, which is you know, really important to me. Yeah, yeah, sure. Filter, yeah, yeah to filter it out. But, all right. Well, it was great talking to you. Where can people find you? Well, my website is Dina at or Dina Brown Mitchell.com. Um, and my nonprofit is realizefoundation.org. And I'm on, I'm not on Twitter, but I, they deleted my account, but I am on um, Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. Awesome. And those those are all under Genius and Sanity. Genius and Sanity. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. I appreciate you. Yeah, you too. Have a great day. Too.